It was a plane that, far from being a radical design innovation, was very much a homogenization of the conventional wisdom of fighter aircraft into one of the last and perhaps the greatest of mass-produced piston-engined fighters. came into being in a roundabout way. The plane was designed to meet a British order as the United Kingdom scrambled almost too late to equip itself for the war that had engulfed Europe. The British wanted to buy the Curtis P-40 but Curtis were flat out keeping up with the demand for their plane and were unable to supply them fast enough for the UK's need. The British Purchasing Commission therefore looked about for someone else to build the Curtis fighters for them. that had already impressed the British greatly was North American Aviation. In 1938, the UK had placed orders with that company for its AT-6 Harvard trainers. The company was a newcomer to aircraft manufacture, having first committed itself to the field in 1934. The Harvard, its first major sales success, was a well-designed conventional plane, and the British were very favourably impressed by it. What had impressed them even more was the quality of its manufacture. The company typified American drive, energy and enthusiasm, and the contracts for the AT-6 were met within deadlines with the highest standards of quality control. North American's approach to mass manufacture, with moving assembly lines and automation wherever possible, streamlined production and allowed for a very high standard of finish. Their planes were built with a minimum of fuss, and though North American may not have been contributing hugely to aviation design at that stage, they were certainly breaking new ground in manufacturing systems. With their high regard for North American aviation's competence and reliability, it's not surprising that the British Purchasing Commission should have approached them to build the P-40 under license from Curtis. Although North American were willing to comply with the request, they did not have much enthusiasm for building a rival manufacturer's aeroplane, and the president of the company, J.H. Kindleberger, an astute engineer and persuasive salesman, suggested that the company would build an entirely new and better fighter for the British. He undertook to complete the design and construction of the first plane in the 120 days it would have taken to tool up for production of the P-40. The P-40 was a development of the series of Hawks built by the Curtis Company, based around its successful but underpowered P-36 design, which dated from 1934. The P-40, fitted with an Allison engine that was supercharged for medium altitudes, was best suited to lower level flying. Being based on a tried airframe that was already in production, it offered low cost and early delivery, and simply because of its availability, it had been ordered in large numbers as a stopgap while work went ahead on more advanced designs. 
Somehow it was to stay in production for most of the war, even though its design was outdated when it was first produced, having been overtaken by the Messerschmitt 109 and the Hurricane and Spitfire and other European designs. Planes with greater maneuverability and firepower and with a clearer role as fighters. In November 1939, the British wanted the P-40 for the same reason that the US was buying it. It was the best available American fighter. The Lockheed P-38 was still far from ready and the P-47 was still to take shape, even on the drawing board. So they wanted the P-40. As North American's NA-73X was developed, the British gave every sign of being delighted. Before its first flight, they had placed further orders for the plane, bringing the total to 620. On the 9th of December 1940, they advised North American that, in line with British policy, they had allocated the aircraft a name, Mustang. The prototype had been ready in 102 days, but then waited for its engine, which was 20 days late. Even so, it was completed just two days outside the set 120 days. The team, led by engineer Raymond Rice and designer Edgar Schmoog, had performed a remarkable feat, and the success of the design that they had produced was, in retrospect, to make the achievement almost unbelievable. SAAF had taken two Mustangs for evaluation and, not overly interested, had only placed orders for the plane, given the designation P-51, as part of a Lend-Lease package. These carried four 20mm cannon in place of the earlier version's eight machine guns. After Pearl Harbor, 57 of these were retained by the Air Force. Though the plane had been evaluated as an excellent airframe, fast, manoeuvrable and long-ranged, the limitations placed upon it by its engine had seen it classed as unsuited to escort work, but suited to tactical support and reconnaissance missions. A part of its secret was its use of the then new laminar flow wing, which shifted the thickest part of the wing as far back as was practical to limit drag. had no funding for additional fighters and with the assessment that the impressive new Mustangs were suited to low-level activities they placed an order for 500 of the planes as dive bombers given the designation A-36 Apache. The A-36 stuck to the variant but they were universally known as Mustangs. With the low-level restriction of the Allison engine these were to be the epitome of the mark purposely equipped as tactical support planes aerial artillery. Seen here in desert condition training in the US, the A-36s were to see considerable service. They ended the war with a record of delivering more bombs per sortie than any other USAAF fighter bomber. On the right of this picture you can see the dive brakes, one of the modifications made to the A36 specification. The armament had reverted to six wing-mounted machine guns and the plane had wing hardpoints for two 500-pound bombs.